You mentioned climbing trees. So one of the things I, I often observe with schools like this is that they, kids often have opportunities to do things that may not be typical in other schools. But that also entails sort of managing those levels of risk. So what does that look like for you? I mean, we really do encourage children to take calculated risks, to feel their way through their own boundaries. We have, we're so very lucky, we're in the, in the middle of the city in Sydney, but we do have a beautiful playground with many, many trees and lots of nature, and we've deliberately kept it that way. So there are lots of trees for different age groups and different ability levels to climb. We part of that democratic process that we have is we always talk about safety. And that's one of the big things that we talk about in school meeting, class meetings, rules, school rules or agreements. And they all come from the children. They all vote, they all decide. So that might, you know, that the children are allowed to climb trees here. They're encouraged to listen to their own bodies, find their own limits, you know, and listen to those feelings that they get, I suppose. Um, children might be enjoying a tree, some of the other children might notice that it's not dangerous. They all notice each other. So they, it might come to the school meeting and we might put some agreements in. Or a teacher might say, this, this limb is probably not strong. We need to have some agreements around this to keep everyone safe. So it's all about owning those decisions, owning those rules so that everyone is responsible for them. This is the Agentic Schools Podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools podcast. Uh, this is Don Berg. I'm with Olivia McCarran and Sarah McGillicuddy from Kern Benna School in Australia. Um, and where in Australia are you again? We're in Sydney. Sydney. Okay, great. That's right. Okay, now I remember looking at the on the map. <laughs> um, so to kick us off, what I want to do is start with um, just tell me a story about a student or a family that really uh, took advantage of what you have to offer really got a lot out of of what you what you do um i have to sift through many many years of it <laughs> we probably both do um i can think of one in particular at the moment and it's quite relevant because it's my own daughter who uh -huh. is at the school at the moment she started when she was three in the preschool she's currently seven so she's been here for a number of years um, she, I guess you could say, has been part of Karambina community since the day she was born, thanks mm -hmm. to me. But with her being at school and being in the preschool and experiencing um, what Karambina has to offer, um, she is a little powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And that's not just me being um, a proud mother. It's me noticing things in her that I would have loved as a child mm -hmm. and things that we try to instill in all of the children here. Um, the, the empowerment that she has to speak up for herself, um, speak up for her friends and for her teachers, um, notice when things are unfair, inequitable, um, kindness, Notice when people are injured and hurt and feeling sad, that's all in her realm and she's very good at noticing that and she acts on that. Um, so in terms of, of the skills that we teach, not only academic, um, but, but that kind of global citizen, that kind of empathy, that kind of connection to your society, that's what she's taking advantage of most at the moment. Right on. Uh, I think... Probably one of the things that um, that I've learned over the years, um, Don, is that you know the children that and adults that return to the school after their own personal experience, um, you know, often say that um, they treasure the time and of being a part of you know a community and you know sort of that Karambina was like family. Um, and it's, you know, can be sometimes for some children more of a safe place than their own home. Um, mm. 
So, um, you know, there, there's there's something very precious that they that the majority of kids that leave take away with them. Right on, right on, very cool. Um, so your your uh, preschool and primary school, what what's the whole age range? So our preschool is three to five, mm -hmm. uh, up into six year olds, you know, depending on that um, when they're ready to move on. And our primary school is from kindergarten all the way up to year six. So that's five six year olds up to 11, 12 year olds. And after that, they move on elsewhere to high school. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Um, and and how do you describe your school to you know the the random person? Is it is there a challenge in you know kind of describing what you do? Uh, I think it depends on who you're describing it to. Um, I think that you know some people because of their own you know their own ideal of schooling come with their own opinions on it. Um, I think um, I, I personally when I first, well, when I first started working here um, and started talking about the place that I was working in um, and you know it being a school was met with challenging ideals mm -hmm. um, you know which was a challenge for me because I felt you know, um, why would anybody not be interested in educating their child in this way? Mm -hmm. um, but, it, you know, it isn't for everybody. And I think that the longer that you hear and that you experience, you know, you have the current better experience, you, uh, you find your words uh, carefully. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, the, the, the staff members or the adults and the families that, that stay here, um, you know, become embedded in the philosophy and therefore, um, you know, um, feel confidently about it. So therefore they, they, they speak that um, to, to others. Um, and I mean, I think that, you know, part of it is that allowing the children to talk for themselves, you know, yeah. um, and when we have information mornings and we have, um, uh, days where you know outside families come in for uh, you know to as potential um, you know families into the school that the children the older children are always brought in to talk um, and part of the feedback one the most positive in feedback is that when when the families and the adults hear the children speak from their own perspective they're always sort of so blown away by their ability to communicate um, and so that's sort of, you know, we can sell it as educated staff members, but when the children who come here talk about it from their perspective, that's the greatest selling point, I think, for anybody. Nice. Yeah, for me, I, I think it's very, very clear in my head what this place is, mm -hmm. um, and that's only from my perspective. And so when I'm trying to explain it to other people, it depends on, on the purpose, whether it's um, older children, younger children, parents who are already sold on this place or perhaps families who are a little bit reluctant to kind of accept what we might be offering. Um, so it really, you have to pull little bits out here and there of, of, of things. But I think the overall part of it is what Sarah did say. It's the children that reflect this place so, so, so well. And the joy that you can see when they're speaking about it and when they're explaining the important bits to them, there's nothing like it. And mm -hmm. that's... And, I don't think there's anyone in this world that could argue that those couldn't be the most important parts of, of development and growing up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right on. Um, so, so one of the interesting things that happens in schools that, that have a long history is that they often develop uh, kind of jargon or code words that are unique to their environment. Um, do you have examples of that, things that, that would be like really great if, if others would take them on? Oh, so it, it's funny because we were having this kind of conversation the other day where a lot of our words, that, that the jargon or the, the words that we used very early on and as we have been evolving are now being used in more mainstream kinds of environments as well. Uh -huh. So we're like, oh, we need to find some new keywords. Um, <laughs> not necessarily because it's mainstream, but because um, it's sort of lost its significance a mm. little bit. I suppose. Um, so we kind of identify with progressive 
Mm -hmm. um, in the more recent years, we identify um, hugely with democratic. Mm -hmm. um, we have a huge uh, focus on social emotional development and that comes across in our conflict resolution skills. Mm -hmm. So from the, the, the very first day that children arrive at Karambina, their families, their community, their, their classrooms, um, I guess, have constant skills in conflict resolution and what that might look like emotionally, the language that we use. So that's huge too, that conflict resolution sort of side of things. Mm. I think fostering responsibility, um, independence, creative thinking. Um, um, empowerment. Yeah, empowerment. So, um, <coughs> and, you know, giving them the foundation of, of language um, and a, a, a strong and varied word bank um, mm. around emotion. Um, and learning for life. Mm, we yeah. use that a lot because it's just so very, very true. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. So, so tell me about how, um, like, like you mentioned a couple of times, you know, that you've got a democratic process and you've got some some things around conflict resolution. Um, tell me how that's structured. Like, what are the what are the ways that that, like, particularly democracy, democratic process, um, but and also, I mean, if you have sort of more formal aspects of the conflict resolution, uh, what do those look like? Um, I suppose the main thing about Karambina is that we're non-hierarchical. So we all have one voice, we all have one say, one vote. Um, that's me, I suppose, as the educational coordinator. We do not have a principal or a headmaster. Um, I, we have um, executive team, an admin team, we have the teachers, we have the children and we have the family and the community at large. Um, we also, I guess, are governed by our school council, mm -hmm. which is made up of parents and teachers and staff. Um, but no one makes decisions by themselves. So it's all a collective decision. And it's as democracy is, it can be long and arduous and messy just to make sure that you have everybody's opinions and um, voices heard so that it's, you know, as democratic as we can get it. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that's, that's where it sits within that. I've lost my train of thought. I can't remember your question now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> democracy, democracy, and yeah. I think too. Uh, one, yeah. yeah, one of the other things, Don, is that. Um, so, as Olivia mentioned, we have we have a school council. Um, from from there, um, they're the governing body of the school, mm -hmm. um, but the the children and the teachers on a day to day basis. Um, we also have lots of meetings as well. So we have every once a week, we have a whole school meeting that includes preschool. Mm -hmm. um, we all gather together and um, the children take charge of that. So they take turns in chairing the meeting um, and having the opportunity to bring topics to the meeting that are discussed. Um, you know, lots of, um, there can be a variety of different topics from children wanting to set up a stall to raise money for uh, charity or uh, reminders about climbing trees, um, how to treat each other nicely, um, um, you know, when we had chickens, how we, how we treat the chickens, um, all those sorts of things. And then from there, each individual class have their own class meetings once a week as well. Nice. So t topics that are more, um, you know, focused on the individual class would, would come up and, you know, you might have a conversation, a dialogue about, you know, what do we want our class environment to look like? How do we want to be behaving within our classroom space? Um, and, and so that you're engaging the children in, in, the, um, in, the, in the process of, so this is what we've decided as, a, a, you know, as a small community in the class, as a wider community within the whole school, um, and then the community that 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 includes, um, you know, the families. Um, so we invite yeah. the families in a lot to to come and have a say, to get their voices heard. I suppose you could say um, yeah. we, and then that comes, I suppose, along with democracy, is that rights and responsibility. So we really encourage them to come and be a part of the school to share with us their expertise on their own children, be part of that decision making process as well. 
um, but also be responsible for things around the school, such as the maintenance, helping, you know, volunteering time. Um, so we're really trying to engage all parts of the community so that we're all feeling heard and we belong mm-hmm. and that we're part of the decision-making process. So none of us make decisions alone. I mm-hmm. mean, um, the teachers and the, and the um, I guess, the executive staff, we all collaborate and come up with a plan together. So. Right on. So one of the things I noticed on your website is that you have an accreditation um, and that you're, so you're, and, and I think that Australia may be organized differently than the United States as far as that goes. So what does that look like? What, what is your relationship? What does accreditation mean in Australia? So it just basically means that we're all bound by the same curriculum and the same regulations um, to ensure safety and a, a level of education occurs. Um, so we we are we are bound by that and we do adhere to all of that. It's just that we choose to achieve those skills in a different way or in a different process. Um, so at the end of a child's experience at Karambina or their journey, they have all the academic skills that they need because we do run with all the curriculum documents and we and we follow the prescribed, um, you know. Requirements. requirements. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But on top of that, we do it in a different way so that the children are earning, are owning their own <clears throat> learning and making decisions about how they learn. Mm-hmm. So we offer that information and support them to find their own way and mm-hmm. to research. Um, you know, there's a lot more going on at Karambina than, than sitting down and, and doing your, your maths. We right. do explicitly teach maths, obviously, um, but we do offer lots of other extra ways to learn that maths in in different kinds of life Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. situations as well i suppose so we are absolutely accredited and um and and we offer more than that and i think Mm -hmm. that's the i think for me that's the beauty they get what they need but they also get it in a way that they can take it for the rest of their lives and it's not just multiplication tables or how to spell particular words they get so much more than that Right. You mentioned uh, climbing trees. So one of the things I, I often observe with schools like this is that they, kids often have opportunities to do things that may not be typical in other schools. Um, but that also entails sort of managing those levels of risk. So what does that look like for you? So, I mean, we really do encourage children to take calculated risks, to feel their way through their own boundaries. Um, we have, we're so very lucky. We're in the in the middle of the city in Sydney, but we do have a beautiful playground with many, many trees and lots of nature, and we've deliberately kept it that way. Um, so there are lots of trees for different age groups and different ability levels to climb. We, part of that democratic process that we have is we always talk about safety. And that's one of the big things that we talk about in school meeting, class meetings rules, school rules or agreements, and they all come from the children. They all vote, they all decide. So that might, you know, that the children are allowed to climb trees here. They're encouraged to listen to their own bodies, find their own limits, you know, and listen to those feelings that they get, I suppose. Um, Children might be enjoying a tree. Some of the other children might notice that it's not dangerous. They all notice each other. So it might come to the school meeting and we might put some agreements in, or a teacher might say, this this limb is probably not strong, we need to have some agreements around this to keep everyone safe. So it's all about owning those decisions, owning those rules so that everyone is responsible for them. Um, and I, in, in my, I've been associated with the school since the 90s. Mm-hmm. Every single child who has learned or wanted to climb a tree has found a way and has mm-hmm. done so in a safe, way because of the way that we expose it to them they allowed to create those those boundaries for themselves where they keep themselves safe Mm -hmm. and that's again one of those skills that we all need in life (laughs) um and and also just the trust that that you you know that you give those children they know they can do it they have the confidence in themselves to do it so that goes a long way Mm. i was just going to add to that that um i think the we 
respect where their limits are as well, you know. So rather than telling them that they can't do something because we believe it's unsafe when they believe in themselves they can do it, um, there's giving them a sense of, um, you know, ownership over that and, and in trusting that the child uh, knows what their limits are, depending on how old they are, obviously, and where their level of maturity is. Um, so we have a lot of tree houses um, and climbing, climbing structures that go up fairly high. Um, and then, you know, and obviously it's, that's all ability leveled so that, um, you know, the older children, um, you know, being more capable and um, can, can extend themselves higher, you know, into the sky. Than, than the younger children, but it gives those younger children something to work towards. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of those high above climbing structures have been designed and built in conjunction with the children as well as part of the art projects that, that have happened in the past. So, nice. yeah. Very cool. Um, give me a sense of, of how big your school is. Like, um, you gave me ages. Uh, how, how many students do you have? How many classes? We currently have 81 children in the primary school and in the preschool, I would say 25, 25 a, day. a day. Yeah. So I think there'd be about 30, 35 families that right. participated in preschool at the moment. Very nice. And um, is it is it uh, largely like uh, drawing from the, the nearby areas or do you how, how widely do you draw people in? Yeah. So I think the majority of people live nearby. Okay. Um, and that the, that majority would be made up of people that have deliberately moved okay. to be nearby um, and people that are in the area who, who know about it and have heard about it before. Mm -hmm. um, there is a percentage of people that travel mm -hmm. um, a fair way to get here on the other side of the city, places mm -hmm. like um, But the majority are from around this area. Right on, right on. Yeah. Um, so are, are there... Um, any sort of, like you, you mentioned, you have trees and tree houses. Those are pretty special resources to have. Are there other sort of uh, other things that are particularly um, uh, like unique resources that you, you offer? I think the craft, the craft space, the craft room would, would be quite unique in the sense that all of the tools are accessible to the kids, right mm -hmm. from drills to saws to nails to mm -hmm. scissors okay. to knives to um, hot glue guns to candle candle wax um, to pottery wheels. Um, You're making it sound very dangerous at the moment. <laughs> and it's all, like I mean, they, it's obviously not a free for all, but but you know the kids are all given access to that um, under supervision yeah. and are taught how to use those those individual tools appropriately, so that um, you know we're ensuring their safety and. Um, and again, it's a bit like the treehouse that, um, you know, as children grow and develop in their um, level of understanding and maturity that, um, you know, their experience with how to use the various different things appropriately is, you know, they're given more licence mm -hmm. um, and opportunity for that. Nice. So in terms of other resources, I mean, we do have a huge um, resource with our, with our art craft teacher as well. So. Most years we would have a huge project that the whole school get to work on. So for example, this year um, we had what, what was called Film Week and the children did all parts of that. So every year there's some sort of creative project that happens. Um, a couple of years ago we did Build Week and that's where we came up with a lot of the cubby houses and tree houses. Mm -hmm. This year was Film Week and we are just about to roll out our, um, our premiere of our film in a couple of weeks that was completely done. Um, and acted out by the children, scripts were written, we had parents come in and help and volunteer with that and guide, um, and it was a huge big community project. So I think that's a really amazing resource that we draw from at Karamina um, that, that sets us aside from many because it, that that seems to be a memory from for many children in years to come. Mm -hmm. And in and from past classes, they often talk about those big big community projects that they've participated in and the learning that comes out of that. So no, that's no, no, too. No. Um, I guess 
as well as that, it's probably not a resource that you're thinking about, but the, the kinds of teachers that we have, the kinds of teachers that we draw from are ones that are passionate about finding something that works not necessarily in the mainstream. So we have a, a, a really great group of teachers, support teachers, relief teachers, extracurricular teachers, um, everyone that's here are really, really passionate about making sure that these children get what they need in terms of our philosophy. So that's a really important thing to put in there too. Right on, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that is important. Um, so, so one of the things that, that often comes up um, is, is screens. And so what is your uh, current relationship and, and has it changed over time? Absolutely. I smile at Sarah then because we've just been talking about that this morning, actually, <laughs> in the process of writing some things. Um, we do believe wholeheartedly that we want to reserve the right for children to play and to experience life through play and through social interactions. And we acknowledge that um, technology and screens and the like uh, have a huge place in our society and we'll, in we'll continue to do that probably more and more increasingly. Um, we do try and balance that with um, their right to play. Um, so we hold that space pretty well. They do have access to iPads, Chromebooks, um, all that kind of stuff here, and that's integrated into our curriculum as well. Um, and they're allowed to use that in their free time, again, with agreements, everything with agreements, and that's come up in the rights and responsibilities. Um, and, they, and they hold that quite well. So we're trying to allow those children to explore those skills and develop um, while balancing that with still being in the natural environment and being here in the moment and, and learning as a group. Yeah, right on. Right on. Yeah. So, um, so talk, you, we, we've mentioned trees. How, how big is your campus? Like, is it, like, what's it like? <laughs> uh, how big is a piece of string? Um, <laughs> we're, I don't even know. I'm, not, I'm, count, I'm counting in my head now. How right. many meters? We do meters over here. It's not huge. It's probably. What do you reckon? It's hard to describe. I guess. I mean, um, we're in a um, a residential area. We're in the middle of a residential area. So we're on a block of land surrounded by houses. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not big, but we have enough room to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine buildings on it. Classrooms. Oh, okay. Um, with some open space and climbing space as well. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Hundred square meters? I don't know. Possibly. I mean, it's. I guess when you you know you've got all the kids in in the in the playground, it. Um, you know they've got a lot of space. Mm -hmm. We'd love more, but it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then you're in a city, right? <laughs> But we are lucky actually around our area, we have some um, really beautiful national parks too. So quite oh, often yeah. um, throughout the week, we can take a group of children bushwalking and um, mm. taking them out into different areas of nature. And mm. So we are lucky in that respect too. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Mm. Um, so, so is your um, school entirely funded by um, tuition or is there state funds? How, what is your, uh, you know, how does that work? So every school in Australia has um, a specific, specific amount of funding from the government okay. and that's set out in different ways um, and there are different, I guess, tiers to it, whether you're an independent school like us, whether you're a government run school um, like the public school system. Um, so we do get funding and assistance from the, um, the government. It's minimal, so we do rely pretty much solely on tuition. Okay, so majority tuition, right on. Yeah, having said that, um, we do try and keep our, our fees as low as we can to make it as accessible as possible to every everyone. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we, we, we try and run so that we can provide this kind of education for whoever wants it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Um, one of the, so, so let's kind of circle back around a little bit. Um, 
when 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 you're kind of recruiting parents and 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 reaching out, um, what is what are some of the sort of education myths that you run into consistently? I think you know that we um, are you know a sort of a free loving hippie school. Um, <laughs> I think that, you know the fact that you know the children sort of run around and. Uh, in their own clothes, so where there's no uniform, um, uh, they can make choices around what they want to wear and whether they wear shoes on their feet uh, around the playground or not. Teachers are called by their first name, so that there's, um, you know, can be this sort of oh, that's just the the hippie school down the road. Um, you know, there is a very um, wholesome, holistic, um, you know. Um, look about the school which is um, intentional but mm -hmm. I think um, underneath all of that you know there are, there is a lot of structure there's a lot of uh, boundaries um, you know not just structural boundaries but um, you know the teaching and the practice of personal boundaries and mm -hmm. um, societal boundaries and all of the rest of it so there's a and, and the, uh, as Olivia said a lot of the conflict resolution so um, the language that goes around with the school so it's um, you know certainly it has evolved over years um, and but but yeah I mean it's it's not um, the children are not cotton wooled in this sort of idealistic Mm -hmm. protected environment. Um, I think we try to make it as problematic and lifelike as mm. possible so that they have, um, you know, developed resilience and, um, you know, and strength around adversity. Um, I mean, maybe not problematic on purpose. No. <laughs> but we do, don't, we don't shield them from problem solving and, and difficulties and challenges. Mm. Yeah. Or mistake making. I yeah. mean, I think you know we we know as adults that you know that's one of the the places that we learn is that you know encouraging, um, not necessarily you know it's it's not about the goal, but it's how we get there, uh, mm. about the, the journey and the experience along the way. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think, um, over the over the in the past, I, and possibly still now, I'm not sure. We have somewhat been tagged as a. Um, a school for children who can't make it or don't don't mm. yes yeah, make it in the mainstream mm -hmm. um, and while we have we have space for everyone here including the children that perhaps have found mainstream challenging we are not a school for that we are a school for, for like-minded people who 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 agree with the philosophy and who are looking for something extra and more for the development of their children mm -hmm. um, and that sometimes does mean that we can provide education and provide great opportunities for children who, for some reason, have struggled in the mainstream. Um, but it's more about individual children reaching their capacity, reaching their goals and being taught and encouraged and loved to do it. Right on. Now, is yeah. there, um, given that, you know, sort of, sort of those impressions, is there, is there a sort of type of family that 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 is predominant there? Like like, what are your? Uh, how would you describe the people who show up for you as families at your school? Legends, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, people who are, who want to be part of the community and want their child or children to have a different education and experience mm -hmm. to life. Um, you know. Um, people who are some more um, place importance on relationships mm -hmm. um, and communication with, with people rather than um, they want their, their children to, to feel loved, to feel wanted, to feel appreciated, to feel like they were part of something. Um, and, and, you know, there might be some families that um, choose you know that way of education for their child because based on their own personal experience at school right. they're looking for something that's um completely different to their own experience um but there is not one type of family that we have they, they come from all sort of i'm just trying to think if i can 
put any into a category, but they're all, you know, so many different kinds of um, professions that the, the parents have. I think the only thing that ties us all together is the thoughtfulness um, and, and the, the wish for more for our children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just so many different types of people, isn't mm. it? Yeah. <laughs> it's really lovely. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, what are some of the uh, things that that you as staff do, sort of behind the? What are the behind the scenes magic that you have to do to make it all work? <laughs> um, well, there's a lot of hard work, and there's a lot of discussion. I mean, and that's and that's not um, unique to our school. That's every education service in the world, I would hope. Um, but I think we work very hard at relationship building as, as a staff, um, and that's really important um, because that breathes into the rest of the school as well. Um, that's not to say that we're all in agreement and, and you know, um, everything is easy and wonderful and, and helpful all the time. We do challenge each other a lot, and I think that's also really important as well. Um, in a school like this that has so many different kinds of people and so many ideas and we're all welcome and allowed to have those ideas there's often a lot of conflict in terms of opposing ideas um, and it's great that we can all sit around and sometimes spend hours <laughs> discussing them but then finally coming to agreements or you know or, or getting new understandings of each other and just being able to put those new perspectives into the curriculum and into the, the lessons with the kids um, and stuff like that. So we we are here with the children um, throughout the day and we often have meetings beforehand where we, we sit down. It might be two people, it might be the whole staff, but we do make sure that every week we speak as a whole staff um, and we're all invited to share personal things, professional things, challenges, wins, um, any issues or anything that they need help problem solved as well. Mm -hmm. so that real collaboration, that cohesiveness um, really takes us. Mm. I think yeah. we're, it's an extremely supportive environment and it, we're all very understanding of, you know, the pressures that we have outside of the school um, mm. as well with in our own, you know, families and our own lives. Um, there's a lot of um, um, flexibility. Um, so, you know, we've, we've had, I mean, just this last couple of years, a couple of staff members sort of needing to go part time for various different reasons. And so, um, you know, that that goes into discussion and um, it's certainly it's something that, um, you know, the school council as the governing body needs to um, be privy to and, and OK. But at the same time, there's there's an understanding and sympath sympathetic um, attitude towards the need for that. Um, um, <clears throat> I, you know, we socialise outside of school, um, you know, so there's there's the closeness between um, some staff members where where they're friends, um, and so there's a relationship that's that's that happens outside of the scene that that supports those relationships because that provides opportunity for you know um, uh, you know time to offload, um, time to be a supportive you know, friend. Um, and so, yeah, that's, it, it's a small staff. And so that's, that's really important that we sort of, and, and it's not to say that, yeah, as Olivia said, that it um, hasn't been without its challenges over the years with <laughs> different staff members. That's just life. Um, How many staff so, do you have? Uh, we've got five primary teachers at the moment. Uh, no, six with me. Um, and there's three in the office. Uh, three preschool teachers. We have two assistants, uh, a Spanish teacher and a craft teacher and a music teacher. Mm -hmm. Wow. 16, 17. Yeah. yeah. And we've got some really great um, relief staff that they're are very close to our school and they're often here as well. So add them in there too. They're part of that community and nice. you'll often see them running around too. Very cool. Yeah. Small staff, but um, and we're, we all are very close. We all sort of try and, and make sure that we have those social situations as well, just to keep the, the the balance, I suppose, between 
um, you know, the nitty gritty of stuff and, and living life and being happy in what you do. Yeah. Nice. So, so let's, um, let's go kind of go back to where we started in a sense. Um, tell me a story about, um, a student or family that, that, or, or situation that presented a particular challenge that at the end of it um, was, you know, the, made the, themselves or their school a better place? <laughs> uh, all of them. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Give us a minute. Um, yeah, sure. Oh, look. Um, I mean, I can go way back to when I first, in my first year of teaching. Um, it's not to say that um, the school became a better place because of the family. Um, I think it was one family who was having um, problems at home um, and a young boy who was in my class um, had... Um, you know, kind of carried a lot of those problems with him um, and a lot of that was acted out here at school. Um, I think that um, the school did everything we possibly could to help support that family um, and I know, f you know, from my own, um, you know, engagement with, with, the, with the mother especially that um, everything that the school did to help support her um, with with both her kids was you know did not go unnoticed mm. um, I mean it didn't necessarily end up with um, you know a win-win for either the school or the family per se but I know that she took away a lot from mm. knowing that her kids were being cared for while they were here at school and she really um, valued that mm. um, and I think from a personal perspective that any kind of challenge that, that is presented to you gives you an opportunity to learn more about yourself, you know, not just as a, as a human but as a, you know, in your practice and how you engage with, um, you know, with little people and big people. And um, so, you know, for me personally that was a massive uh, introduction to the school and to... Um, um, the challenges that it presented um, and I've been here nearly 17 years now so the fact that that was my first year of teaching it says, sort of says that you know I didn't um, let that get to me um, mm. and that you know that's it's one of the things that I always notice about um, people that return um, is that they, they're not shy of the impact that it leaves on you um, however great or small um, that it is it is a special place um, and it's not all sunshine and lollipops no. <laughs> right right nothing is but it's not and 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 we don't profess to be but what we do profess to be is real and supportive and um, and everyone who comes into here will hopefully come out of it with some sort of positive something um, that they've learnt or experienced or developed in, in their, their journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think everyone would probably have a story like that. Right on. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's um, wrap it up here. Um, give, give, give our audience a sense of where to find out more. Where should they look to get more information? Uh, well, I mean, we... we we're part of, um, you know, an international democratic community, community. So, I mean, looking at somewhere like um, uh, um, looking at the website IDEC, so that's I-D-E-C, that's the International Democratic Education Community. From there, um, there's an Australasian Democratic Education Community. We're part of that. Um, progressive Education, um, uh, Democratic Education, our website, um, What's your website? What's the URL? Uh, Karamina.nsw.edu.au. Okay. Yeah, look it up. Spell Karambena for them. C U W A R A M B E N A. Okay. Yeah. Spell Karambena for them. C U W R A M B E N A. That's um, pronounced Karambena. Karambena, yeah. yeah. Very good. <laughs> 
All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your time. And uh, thank you very, again. Thank, thank you. you so much, nice, John. Nice to meet you, John. All right. Bye.